Ladies and gentlemen, joining me on the line as he does every week on the show. He writes about movies. He watches movies. He lives movies. Friends, his name is Mike Reyes. Hey, Mike, what's going on? Not much. How you doing, man? I'm good. You know what movie turned 20 this year, uh, this month, or this week, I should what? say? Which year, one? month, time, without a paddle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> The only reason I bring it up is because I use it for my nostalgia piece this week, and it's got one of my f my favorite lines from any movie ever. Oh, it looks like we're at the corner of bum and you got a pretty mouth. <laughs> that was one of those movies that my brothers, my father, and I went to see because that was just that period where we saw everything. Yeah. Like every weekend we would go to see something, and that just happened to be the week movie of that weekend. Now that movie is funnier than people give it credit for. I'll, I will argue that it's not a bad movie, but it it does have some legitimately funny parts in it. But uh, uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, Mike, you're on the line with me this week again to talk about movies. I'm uh, going to be doing a little bit of time traveling because we have two movies out this weekend that look scary in their own ways. Uh, we're going to see one of them tonight, but uh, The Crow and Blink Twice are out this weekend. Funny thing, now that we mentioned The Crow, I forgot to talk, uh, mention this to you earlier. Someone apparently wrote a review on Letterboxd, and they were they are not a critic. Okay. But they're like, oh, since it, it was since it was a critical embargo and I'm not a critic, I don't care. I'm going to tell you what I thought about the movie. All right. And that is just baffling. What did they say? Just, it, it, hold on. I'm trying to look it up right now. <laughs> Because someone just really like, like the, the, apparently the review embargo does not lift until we're recording this on Thursday tonight when the first showings have started. That's not a good sign. No, no, that is. And that's not a, that's not something that shocking by any stretch of the imagination. It's not something that hasn't been done before Yeah. because a lot of movies where like, there's no confidence. It's like, okay. Or for some reason they, they just have their reasons. The studio will be like, look, we're going to save this for when people are going to see it. Interesting. Okay. So basically what we know about this, this is a, what did you, was, is it a reboot or a reimagining or what did you call it the other day? Basically it's a, it is a, it is a, I think I said it's a bold reimagining okay. of James O'Barr's original comic in a new film form. I found the review. Okay. <laughs> I'm kind of legitimately interested in what they say. Just random person, I, random human being Frozen, talking about this movie. Yep. Frozen 2 fan 2004. <laughs> <laughs> Which I legit wonder, uh, part of me kind of wants to wonder, oh man, par part of me kind of is wondering, it's like, is this someone from the PR campaign trying to drum up a story and well, like they, they leak, quote unquote, or break embargo, quote unquote, and put this review out there because people are already primed to not like this film. Well, that kind of raises the question, is it a good review for the movie or is it a bad review for the movie? Oh, no, it's a bad review. It's okay. a one star. But, like, m movie marketing can get weird at times these days. Like, you saw how they thought Mor Morbius was good enough to that people were actually behind Morbius to bring it back to theaters. Well, Just I'm, because a lot of people made its Morbin time trend. Yeah, I, I mean, we're going to cover this again here in a minute with the Megalopolis stuff. But here's my take on this, and, and maybe you'll see this one tonight, or maybe you'll see the other movie blink twice, but... I don't need a reimagining of the original movie. You set up a really cool universe where the crow could be anybody that's essentially wronged in the world and needs to come back to avenge stuff, right? Right. There were entire sequels and there was an entire TV show that focused on that too, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, why do I need uh, Bill Skarsgård to come back as the original crow? Nostalgia bucks. I, I guess. I don't know, man. I just... Do I want another Crow movie? Yeah, sure. Give it to me. I'm cool with that. I, I don't need... The the original Crow was pretty good. The original Crow is... Oh, I love the original Crow. But I, and that's I, part of what's been going on in this house because my wife is a huge fan of the Crow, too. And ever since this thing was announced that it was going to actually be released, because this has had quite of a quite a cursed life. I didn't know Rob Zombie was trying to make a Crow movie at one point. I want to look more into that. But also, this movie alone went through several different leads. The original studio went bankrupt, and this transferred over to Lionsgate. And then we, no one knew that it was going to be when it was going to be released because I think it was finished filming 2022, 2023. 
<laughs> and then out of nowhere, Lionsgate was like, yeah, we're going to delay Ballerina in the next year because we want to put more action into it. So we're going to release Borderlands of the Crow instead. Well, we, we saw how well Borderlands did review-wise. Yeah, <laughs> and I <laughs> part of me wonders about that because Borderlands 4, the game, just got a trailer. So I'm wondering if like part of the whole 4D chat was like, yeah, sure, release Borderlands in, in August. Yeah, and then at Gamescom, we're going to release this trailer and everyone's going to flock to it because they're going to be happy they're getting yeah. what they want again. All right, so we'll see and what happens. Maybe it would help boost things. Yeah. No, I... I don't have good hopes about this movie. I just, I don't have Honestly, a good feeling I about need, it. Me neither. I need to see how bad it is. <laughs> and yeah, but uh, you say I just, that, I, but it, you say that, but you came out of Borderlands thinking it was okay. Borderlands is something that I was not very, exp I was not totally exposed to the source material on. Okay. The Crow. I've watched it several times. We did an overdue rentals episode on it. Like I am, I am entrenched in the Crow. Okay. All right. And you know what, for the people out there, uh, the second crow, I did not hate that. City of Angels, right? Yeah. Now, was that still an Eric Draven story, or was that another? Because I, I think they, I don't think they ever did an Eric Draven follow up. It was just no. It was another. It was essentially what I just said, where it's another guy gets wronged in the, you know, in the yeah, no, gets yeah, wrong, gets killed, exactly, and comes back. That's exactly how it should go. The, the whole concept, like you said, the whole concept of the crow was it just a spirit of vengeance yeah. someone dies their soul can't cross over there's a big wrong that needs to be right the crow comes and brings this person back to clean up their business and then they're dead yeah this trailer makes it look like some new marvel action style version of it and i think they're going to try and leave the door there, there were some comments about how they apparently have an ending that is less than conclusive so what they probably wanted to do is leave the door open for hey if people actually, based on a wing and a prayer, like this thing, yeah. we can do another one. You ready, Bill? <laughs> uh, Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me right now as we talk about uh, some of the movies. Again, we're going to uh, be talking about, uh, we'll have an actual review of either The Crow or uh, Blink Twice. That's the other movie that's coming out this weekend that kind of looks fascinating in a weird way because Channing Tatum isn't usually played as the, he's usually the funny, cool guy. Or the funny frat guy or Remy Laveau. Yeah. He's not usually, yeah, he's, you know, scary, I'm going to kill you in a weird way vibe. Yeah, like scary tech douche that invites people to his secluded island for a game of and then there were none, which is exactly what this looks like. And I'm going to be totally honest with you. I think if it's being left as dealer's choice, because I was wondering which movie your, the, our audience might want to hear more about. I honestly think it's just going to be, I'm going to do Blink twice, because if I'm being given a choice here... I don't my, know. My, there's, I a, my, there's a lot of guys my age that The Crow was a big movie when I was growing up, you know? It was, and if I'm looking at this the right way, I think those are the sort of fans that are like, leave it where it lie. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll, you know what, when it goes to stream, I, I'm yeah, assuming yeah, yeah. those people would be like, don't torture yourself. If I had the time, I'd probably go see both. And yeah. I really wish I had gotten an, if I had an advanced screening of Blink twice, like if I had gone to that screening, I would definitely be going to see, well, no, I'd probably go see Romulus in 40X and then yeah. the crow. Real quick, I was looking, I was pulling up the <laughs> Wikipedia for Blink twice, uh, which actually I have two thoughts about this. One is strictly Channing Tatum, but did you see what the working title of uh, Blink twice was? Oh yeah, it was originally <laughs> Island. <laughs> <laughs> like that was something that was reported way back when Zoe Kravitz was announced to be doing the movie. Oh, that's that, that was wonderful. like, yeah, her directorial debut that she co-wrote. It's called Island, and it's like, nice. nice. That's I want to hear the explanation for that. Here's my other thing I want to do. Uh, tell you real quick. Do you have uh, your computer pulled up in front of you? Always. All right, pull up just an image search for Channing Tatum. You really want to distract me from work? Yeah, I do. I just realized who I want Channing Tatum to play in a movie. Okay, so I've got the Channing Tatum image page up. All right, now pull, uh, open up another tab. Do an, okay. do an image search for Randy Orton. Oh, shit. I want to see Channing oh. Tatum play Randy Orton. There would need to be a facial prosthetic. Like a little it's bit not of much, though. The, the chin is what really, the, the chin would, and maybe a, um, the nose and the chin. It's yeah. not far off, man. They could at least be brothers or cousins. Maybe. You put the tattoos on it and the mustache that uh, Randy likes now. 
You've got, uh, anyways. And then you give him the intensity that he had for Foxcatcher. And yeah. then that's that's probably it there. Uh, Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me. So we'll do some time traveling at the end. We'll see uh, what we talk about. Maybe it'll be uh, Blink Twice. Maybe it'll be The Crow. Who knows? We'll see. Look, uh, it's going to be Blink Twice because my, I was talking about this with my wife earlier. And she's like, if we're going to, if you're going to see Blink Twice, sure, I'll go with you. If it's The Crow, you're on your own. <laughs> and like, the, the, I, I cannot understate this from the moment this, from the moment this thing jumped off. I put the I put the first trailer in like a friend chat that we had, and then she's like, "I accidentally watched that trailer. What did you do to me? I told you I didn't <laughs> want to see that." And I was like, "I didn't mean to do that, but someone's got to someone's got to break it to you." And I would rather it be me. She's like, "No," like we sat here for 15 minutes on Facebook while I was in New York last weekend. <laughs> And we just ran for 15 minutes alternate titles for this film because he's like, I am not calling that thing The Crow. Hey. So we have The Contrite Bird, Dollar Tree Antihero, <laughs> Gothic Joker, If Lights On Hot Topic Had a Movie, Great Value Corvid, La Croix Presents Hashtag Damaged, what? The Saddest Mullet in the World, and my personal favorite, Borderlands 2. Okay, uh, you remember uh, uh, the uh, Fury Road? And that's not even all of them. I remember Fury Road, the Mad Max movie. Yeah. Who are the yeah. guys with the chrome on their mouth? The War Boys. Uh, it's a War Boy grown up. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> what AI thinks all people want, and then of course my wife had to throw in a couple uh, interview with the vampire things. Dollar General Lestat, Trailer Park Lestat. <laughs> Trailer the kind of man. <laughs> uh, I also I also threw in Crost Malone. Yeah. Oh wow, that gets nothing but Trailer Park was that. Like, I'm sorry, it was be, pretty. My wife will be thrilled with that. It was pretty I'm like, funny. I'm sorry, but uh, anyways, that was pretty funny. Uh, it just came out of nowhere. I just really like it. Uh, Mike Reyes from it Cinema is, Blend yeah. on the line with me right now as we talk about movies. All right, so we'll get to. Uh, 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 that here in a little bit, uh, with some time travel, I want to touch on a couple reviews. My wife and I did end up watching the union this past weekend with, uh, Matt Wahlberg or Mark Wahlberg, Matt Wahlberg, Mark Wahlberg and Halle Berry. <laughs> yeah. God, you talk about a disappointment. I, I heard some, I like, I saw it got a pretty bad Rotten Tomatoes score, which I don't always put stock in that sort of thing because Rotten Tomatoes is just basically, yeah, the critic scores yeah. like tabulated by positive or not and there's a percentage and it's like yeah i i, I get that but you know it's I, people can still be different mm -hmm. and and now that now they're actually trying to put in a uh you know how rotten tomatoes has certified fresh yeah now there's going to be one for the fan reviews called verified hot oh okay that's lame but whatever well it's basically like hey the critics may not have liked this but the fans do and it's yeah. like i don't no, it's you're. It's just the same thing. It's a different hat. It's take take any movie where you take a random person and put them into something where they have to train for whatever, being a fish goalkeeper. Yeah, fish out of water type stuff or whatever. It's that, but there's no stumbling blocks. Like the guy <laughs> just gets it all of a sudden in two weeks. Super spy. I'm a Jedi. Yeah, this. I'm a freaking Jedi. It's it's that it's uh, zero problems with killing. There are bones for a, an interesting movie there, and Mark Wahlberg and Halle Berry, good together. But it is very predictable. It is very like take a lot of you know the regular thought out of the process, and hey, we're just not going to worry about it. You know? Yeah. I was hoping it would be better. I'll put it that way. Like the the trailer looked fun enough, but yeah. it's like okay, I I've, I've I've played this game plenty of times. You need to give me something good here, and like I'm I don't know which what I'm more mad about that they wasted Halle Berry or they wasted J.K. Simmons. If this is really that bad, <laughs> he was pretty funny in it. I did like him. I love J.K. Simmons. Like the have you ever heard the story about how he got the M and M's gig? No. So there's a great video that I think it was GQ did like the one where they break down like all the uh the actors like actors most notable roles yeah and there were some really cool stories in there like uh jk simmons talked about how uh i think he said stan lee was kind of an uh upset that they didn't offer him J. jonah jameson and spider-man stan lee wanted to like play that part okay and he was also talking yeah it was a gq video so he talks about how 
he got the audition for the M&M's gig and he wanted to play the red M&M. And he was like trying to pitch them as like, I want to do this, you know, this would be so really cool, blah, 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 blah. And then I think it was his, uh, I don't know if it was his, his rep or the person that was running the auditions. They're like, trust us, you, you really should try out for yellow. And then he read for yellow and then really dug it. And then he's like, well, when they cast Billy West as red, it was like, forget it. That was, that was the thing there. <laughs> I mean, when you get a chance, you should watch the whole video because he just sounds like an awesome dude. I like it. I like it a lot. He w- he was a good part of that movie. Uh, the other one uh, we watched this week, we finally got to every uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. And uh, very, very cool movie. But it is beyond all the awards it won and, you know, accolades. You know what it, it <laughs> struck me as? What? The very, very fine line in a movie of being so out there that no one understands it versus award-winning accolades and all that. I think I get what you're going with there. Like, you mean, like, it's a, it's a fine line between being an award-contending film and something that people can act, that's very accessible for people. Yes. Um, no, absolutely. Because this you know, movie, Daniel... you look at certain parts of it, and you could make fun of a lot of it. You could be like, what in the f*** were they trying to do here? That movie could I mean, have been that really easily. If you if you're not careful with it, yeah. But the Daniels were very they they subscribe to something called maximalism, which is literally what it does on the tin. It's the opposite of minimalism, where it's like throw everything out there, yeah. be as colorful and bold and weird as you can be. But there was still that very human purpose and that human core to it, and I think that's what makes it accessible. Because if you're not sit if you're not at least minorly worried about how your viewers are going to react to this. You're just basically making, you're, you're, you're whiffing your own fumes. You're basically just sitting there and it's like, ah, yes, cinema. But if you want, you can be that out there. You can do that, but you have to make sure that you're still giving people an entry into your mind, into your, your thought. And it's like, it's very similar to some of the stuff you've said on the show about, franchises sort of walking the line between doing something new and giving fans what they want. Yeah. I just, it, that's what was hitting me during this movie. I'm I'm like, I'm really enjoying this, but man, if they would have gone just a little one way or the other, we would be sitting here going, what the f are they doing with the hot dog fingers? Like, Oh yeah. You know, I mean, they're like, that would probably be, yeah, that would be the only thing the movie would be known for. And it's just like, it would be, it's, it's Morbius. It would be memed. People make it popular because yeah, they're memeing it. It's not, they're making, not making it popular because they like the movie. They're making it popular because they're laughing at it, not with it. So this, it's just such a touching movie. It's, it's a very, very, I want to watch it again because it's, uh, it's one of those movies that it's so weird that I liked it but I wanted to watch it again to process it a little bit more. Oh, no, I I fully agree. It's very entertaining and very funny, but there are parts of this movie where it just, it broke me. It really hit to to the core because something that came out when they were making the film was that one of the Daniels basically self-diagnosed themselves as having ADHD. And this film was very coded into that sort of thing because Evelyn was originally supposed to be a character that they outright said she had ADHD. And again, you just look at the concept and the title, you know, everything, everywhere, all at once. That's sometimes what it feels like on like one of the the lesser days or one of the where like your focus is not in one place and it feels overloading. And like there's so much that like it almost feels like its own damn multiverse you have to keep track of. No, it, it was a, a completely agree, and it's uh, it, it was a very interesting movie, and I, I'd like to give it another run just to just to process a little bit more. Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend is on the line with me right now as we make our way through the uh, world of movies and entertainment. Like I said before, we'll do some time traveling. We'll get a review at the end here for, I believe you said Blink twice. Couple uh, interesting stories floating around out there. I want to save Star Wars Acolyte towards the end, uh, but we'll get there by going through Megalopolis. Uh, I just stumbled across this story and uh, you can give me the whole breakdown but essentially a movie trailer came out for a movie called megalopolis and then it was pulled down because the reviews were possibly faked is that kind of what it was okay you are totally underselling this because (laughs) the stakes are much bigger okay let's just rewind a little bit megalopolis 
the Francis Ford Coppola, man who directed The Godfather and Apocalypse Now and these movies that some people, basically studio execs, were kind of like questioning of it, but these movies were genuinely heralded as like big swings and big beauties in their own time. Oh, and also Dracula. We have to mention Bram Stoker's Dracula because all three of those films become, they're connected to what we're going to say. Okay. So Megalopolis is Francis Ford Coppola's passion project. He has been wanting to make this movie for years. And like no studio was going to finance it. He finally like leveraged his winery and was just like, fine, I'm going to put up the massive budget to make this thing by myself. Like, I think Megalopolis is, it looks like it's going to be a hundred million. It's like a hundred million is the, the, the full production cost. Like he basically pulled a horizon, 20 to 120 million. He basically pulled a horizon where like he put his own money into this and was like, I am making this because the studios don't want it. And I want to make it like he sold a port. It says here on Wikipedia, sold a portion of his winery to fund it. This man has always been has always had projects like this where he puts his whole ass into it like you go back into the 80s like uh two from the heart i think is another one that was very much that weirdo film that like almost sank his career totally so they have to market this thing lionsgate became a partner on this and was like yeah we're, we'll, we'll release the film with you because it took a while, like he had European distribution for this when he went to Cannes this year, but nothing came out of domestic. And then finally Lionsgate is like, yeah, we're totally going to do it. Like IMAX was behind him before he had a studio. But then when Lionsgate jumped in, it was like, yeah, that's, that's a no brainer. So there's a lot riding on this movie. And it's, if it wasn't bad enough, that there are stories and supposed and videos that supposedly show Francis Ford Coppola kissing extras against their will oh, like giving awesome. them kisses on the cheek and embracing them against their will like there's videos and i don't discredit people's claims but i think there needs to be a little more looked into but that's just you know it's a valid claim it's something that's going to have to be talked about and ultimately reckoned with when this movie comes out because it's out there it's a story you can't say it's not but as if that wasn't bad enough a trailer drops yesterday a wonderful Lawrence Fishburne voice trailer. And honestly, that man's voice is still rich and oaky, oaken and just wonderful. Yeah. So it is a, they have been going hard on this ad campaign where it's basically like, yeah, if you have a vision, you should follow it. And this latest trailer dropped yesterday morning and was pulled last night because it had erroneous quotes from various film critics about the godfather apocalypse now and dracula and they were from pretty big critics like pauline kale <laughs> andrew saris roger ebert and owen gleiberman who's now, who's over at variety and they were things they were basically quotes that were supposed to say show that all these movies were underdog stories like i think owen gleiberman's quote was like oh a beautiful mess for dracula and then there were some disparaging quotes for like godfather and apocalypse now and then people started questioning it and couldn't find these quotes. <laughs> oh, here we go. Andrew Sarris calling The Godfather a sloppy, self-indulgent movie. John Simon calling Apocalypse Now a spectacular fail. And Orm Gleiberman calling Dracula a beautiful mess. And yeah. The, oh, and then Roger Ebert's quote of triumph over, of style over substance for Bram Stoker's Dracula is a real quote. But it came from his review of 1989's Batman. How did anybody think this was going to be a good idea? I don't know. I mean, we live and in a I world where seriously... all this stuff is at people's fingertips. It was seriously disheartening because it, it, it feels like a, an echo of years ago when the Sony's marketing department invented a film critic called David Manning. Yeah. And he would give quotes for movies that, from everything from Spider-Man to Vertical Limit. And it got to the point where people exposed that. And there was a class action lawsuit where it's like, did you see Vertical Limit? You could technically get your money back or part of your money back <laughs> as part of this class action lawsuit. And I was thinking to myself, like, oh, first of all, Vertical Limit was, eh, I'm not too busted up that I went and saw it. It was on a date, you know, you got to see something. 
But also it's like, the, but it did kind of piss me off where it's like, okay, like you created a critic. That's the part that really gets me. Yeah. And just between this and the whole thing with the crows, the crows marketing. Oh man. I, um, there was a, uh, there was a party for the crow. Uh, there was supposed to be a party for the crow. There was like a VIP party experience last Friday in New York and LA. And I don't know if LA's was any different. But I went to the New York experience and it was nothing. <laughs> and uh, like I went with a fellow journalist, we went for five minutes and then turned back around. And just it's it's really curious how the, the, the marketing on these movies is is being played. Like Megalopolis looks like like a, there, there's a lot of people they, they could have just stuck with the quotes from Can. Because Ken had a lot of people that were on both sides of this thing where it's like, it's an overindulgent mess. Oh, it's messy, but it's something that we should see because it's an original vision. Like there were, there were quotes for that. And it's like, why didn't we just stick with that instead of whatever that, like, I'm wondering how the, how these quotes were even generated. Like, how did the, uh, it just, it, it, well, it goes back yeah. to the thing of who thought this was a good idea. Like who thought like, Hey, let's do this and it's going to work. Exactly. And I feel sorry for Lionsgate to a point because, like I said, they pushed Ballerina. Ballerina was probably going to be a money printer because you've got Ana de Armas and a John Wick spinoff yeah. with Keanu Reeves coming back as John Wick. But apparently they're like, well, we want to put more action into the movie. And now I'm thinking, do you want to put more action into it or are you afraid of what people are going to or how people are going to react to this? Because let's not forget, Borderlands was also subject to reshoots that may or may not have come from the fact that Eli Roth may have been just been done with the movie and he he just happened to be making Thanksgiving at that time. I, I feel like some of the marketing for this stuff and some of these ideas, man, it is so, you either get it or you don't. Yes. And a prime example of people that get it Ryan Reynolds. is the Alien Romulus marketing team. Yeah. Because Alien Romulus had the advanced screenings. They had all that cool stuff with like the Comic-Con panel where they had a, a practical chest bur or RC chest bursters or no <laughs> face huggers go in. And then they had people like someone on stage pretending to have a chest burster burst out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were doing like viral marketing events where they've got people out by posters laying on the ground with like face hugger animatronics <laughs> on them. And that just disturbed the hell out of me. Yeah. And then they even, you know, have the popcorn buckets. I don't see a popcorn bucket coming for the crow or for Megalopolis. I know there was a clap trap for Borderlands, but it's like that that's probably gonna only get you half the way there. Yeah. It's like seriously, what is going on? Well, that'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Uh Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend. They did issue out an apology though, didn't they? It's good that you mentioned that because this really is something that should be addressed. Uh, Lionsgate put out a statement. Oh, that's that's weird. It it, it uh, well, it basically boils down to we screwed up. Lionsgate is immediately recalling our trailer for Megalopolis. We offer our sincere apologies to the critics involved in the Francis Ford Coppola and American Zoetrope for this inexcusable error in our vetting process. We screwed up. We are sorry. <laughs> but it had to see. That's the thing. Like all this stuff, especially when you get into a corporation that big, a company that big, it doesn't go through just one person. It's not just like one person decided to get on, you know, uh, hey, I'm going to make a trailer for uh, Megalopolis. I'm going to do it like this. Like it, it went through a process. You're telling me that no one at Lionsgate at some point goes, hey, guys, um, I don't know if we should be doing this. That, My, that's the scary I can't, part I, to I me. I can't even begin to speculate on this because I don't want to, I don't want to slam them too hard because of the fact that this is a studio that I'm going to continue to be working with. No, and I, I do like Lionsgate. I mean, you want to look at the Lionsgate story in total. This is a company that built itself off the back of things like American Psycho and yeah. Saw. And eventually when they merged with Summit, you had Hunger Games and Twilight in there. Like they have, they've had juice to become a mini major. And I, but when you've got stuff like this kind of floating out there, it's like, I'm, it, it's just deeply curious and deeply unsettling when you see things like that. And it's like, well, especially when studios are so careful when they ask critics for quotes. Yeah. And like I have had reps that come back to me and I'll say, okay, do you mind if we use this quote? And they'll show me the quote that they, they're thinking of. Yeah. And then we, the source that they pulled it from, from my review or from my, my reactions. 
and they'll come back to me and ask. And it's like, yes, I approve of that. I, I get kind of the idea of what they're trying to do, but it, it's more the process of how they went about it. I'm not going to beat them to death for it. Um, but no, it, it, I agree with you. It's but, not, it, they're trying to say, Oh, go on. But it's, it's like, how did you get this done? Like nobody went through this and thought, Hey, this might be a bad idea or like, it didn't go through just one person that, you know, put this thing out. It, it had to go through people. It had to go through a marketing department. I mean, hell you had to go to the production department and tell them, Hey, I need you to make this. It's that part yeah. of it that's frustrating. It's like you went through the whole process with this, but on the other hand, we are talking about megalopolis. <laughs> so, and that's exactly why I, uh, that that's why I question things. Cause it's like, we're talking about megalopolis. We're talking about the crow. Yeah. And there's these, but there's these little things that happen where it's like that. I sent you that crow review and it just, it totally slams the movie and it's just some rando on the internet allegedly yeah. saying, Hey, this movie sucks, but All right. I don't know if it's that or if it's just maybe they were encouraged to do it. Cause it's like people get talking about it and it might give us a slight bump. Maybe. And that also just sucks because it's like, it, it's not, a, it's not bad enough that critics and, and film uh, entertainment journalists already have like enough threat to their job because of social media influencers. Like now you've got things like this happening and it's like, okay. Uh, so what about, you know, actual official reviews? Like why, why, why is this and not that? I don't know, man. Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me right now as we talk about the world of entertainment, movies, and everything in between. Uh, as we get closer to the end here, we will, like I said, do some time traveling, get you a review of uh, Blink twice. However, uh, some of the other big movies, uh, not even big movie, but it has to do with a big movie franchise and a big company. Uh, the Acolyte. I can of, take a nap now. The Acolyte officially canceled. There will be no season two of this uh uh, Star Wars series from Disney Plus. I s have seen a lot of interesting reactions to this. Tell me how busted up you are that the show got canceled. I'm not. It's and I'm not going to beat this thing to death because, you know, like we talked about, you know, there were just parts that were frustrating about this series. I, don't, I was going to say, look, if we're talking about this, talk about it. Go full clip because we may never talk about the Acolyte again. I, Unless something big happens, like... There, Disney supposedly releasing a comic that is they're they're very clearly saying this happens a hundred years before the <laughs> acolyte. Don't don't hurt us. It, it never bothered me. Like I know there's people out there that the uh, uh, the quote unquote politics of it and the uh, you know the the space witches and uh, it's too gay or what you know whatever people were saying about it in on that side of it that part of it never bothered me about this series. I, I it didn't come into play whatsoever. It was clunky storytelling at time, bad storytelling. It was too many flashbacks. It was characters that don't make sense or characters that are idiots when they should be a lot smarter than they are. It, it just, it was not a well put together Star Wars series to me. Were there bones yeah. of something that could have been kind of interesting? Some interesting ideas that we've talked about with, uh, you know, how you use the whole twins thing and the force and, uh, you know, the, the possibility of the Jedi not being kind of, uh, uh, you know, as, as much of heroes as we thought they were. There's some interesting yeah. threads in there, but you did it job telling the story and on top of that the idea that you know we, we talked about this a few weeks ago where it was star wars is one of those companies lately that i feel like they're like you say shut up and eat your star wars there, yeah there's too much of the you know F you if you don't like it it's a you problem it's not an us problem it's a you problem yeah you know hey. it, it 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 feels more like that where you look at some of these other franchises and the reason I want to take it this direction is because I saw an interesting thing. And I don't know if it's, if it's real or not, it's another TikTok thing, but the idea of possibly the success of Deadpool and Wolverine yeah, having an effect on how they looked at something like the acolyte where you, on one hand on Deadpool and Wolverine, you have a movie that embraced its fandom and gave its fans exactly what they wanted. And, and whether the movie completely made sense or not, it doesn't matter. 
you gave the fans <laughs> Deadpool and Wolverine in all its glory. You had a blast doing it. You gave them a whole bunch of, you know, crazy Easter eggs and, and uh, cameos and all this. But it was fun. It was what the fans had wanted for how many years? Yeah, you make a Marvel movie like every other Marvel movie out there. And then you took something like Star Wars and it's like, no, we're not going to make the series we you want. We're going to make the one we want. And if you don't like it, tough. To a certain extent, I think you got to go into something with that, th that, mi that thought, that mindset. Like, I get that you want to give the fans what they want. I get that. But at the same time, if you don't branch out and take swings, then you get into periods of, of sort of. I don't always get the, I know what you're fans. saying. I, because that's how you expand a universe. That's how you make it deeper. That's how you give it more uh, coloring and depth and, and just feeling. However, you can't, I, I, I feel like Star Wars and Disney was, uh, or Disney with Star Wars has an, a very standoffish attitude of, if you don't like it, it's your problem. I don't feel I think like that's any creator. I don't feel I think like that's any creator worth their salt. But I, I, I don't think Disney, like, I don't always get the feeling that Dis, the, the Star Wars Disney side of things embraces their fandom. It feels like they more want to argue with their fandom than embrace them. Partially, because you still got stuff like The Mandalorian that very much embraces its fandom. It puts the blanket around them. It gives them their hot chalky with their little Grogu stuffy. And it gives them Luke Skywalker, youngish with a lightsaber in like the era that we didn't get to see him in because they didn't make movies. And that's, that's awesome. That's what I want to see every week. And it's like, no, you're just retreading the past. And I get it. But that's the other side of this coin where you dive too deeply into fan service. You go too deep into the weeds of like, this is what people want. And it just, we're even talking about this with alien Romulus right now. There is a debate over some of the callbacks in there yeah. probably shouldn't have been in there. And there's a whole character where people are asking, why was this character here? Why was this approach used? And even though I'm fine with them being in there and the approach that they use, and there's a really heartfelt answer for why they did, I still think there was a valid alternative. But I'm not going to go slamming the movie for it. But at the same time, you've got a movie right now where, like, right in the middle of the public opinion crowd is just the phrase, Alien Romulus is the Alien franchise's greatest hits. And depending on how you interpret that, that's a blessing or a curse. I just, I, I feel, I just have this feeling with Star Wars that they, again, I, I don't think they always embrace their fandom. They're almost snooty no, about it. No, the whole theme park land about it. Yeah, but that's that's Disney trying to make money. Let's be honest here. <laughs> they just built a whole theme park land where you can build lightsabers and talk to droids. <laughs> And they I, again, completely have so many movies and shows in the pipeline. They don't. They don't want Star Wars at all. No, it's it's. But I don't always think that they go the direction that they the fans. And again, me, you, and I argue and see this a little bit differently. And I'm not saying that that you should always do exactly what the fans want. That that is not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that you should just ignore what they want either. But we're. I think we're both agreeing that there's a balance that needs to be struck. It's just how that balance is struck. That and, seems, it's, and that's if you can get to that granular of a point, then maybe we're not that far off as a society. Yeah, and I don't think I think that balance is out of whack for them. Um, yeah, I, I, that is something we can definitely agree on. Uh, Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me right now. All right, we'll wrap it up there for uh, this. We'll do some time traveling, and we'll be back with a review of some sort. Does that sound cool? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say we're at the end of a Star Wars conversation. All right, time machine noise. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've done some <laughs> traveling. <laughs> you know it's a good. You know it's a good noise when you can make yourself laugh. Over oh. It. The fart noise at the end is what sold it for me. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh oh, completely. Oh, like, just, I, like time travel, serious business. Uh, Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend is on the line with me right now. He's being very very quiet. 
because he's actually in a library right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or at least I'm trying to be as quiet as I can be because I don't want to disrupt other patrons. Like, libraries are a sacred place as far as I'm concerned. Um, all right. So, uh, as we did say, uh, we were going to do some time traveling. We are going to do uh, get a review from you last night. Uh, went and saw Blink twice. What do we think? It's pretty good. It's Zoe Kravitz's directorial debut. She also co-writes the script to the film. And for the uninitiated, it is basically a story where Channing Tatum plays this kind of disgraced tech baron, like tech bro, who has his own island and decides to, you know, invite random people over to, to have some fun. And uh, it may not be as fun as people think it is. By fun, do you mean murder? Uh well, I'm not going to spoil it because you can watch the trailer and, and judge for yourself, but it definitely, uh, it's a bit uneven for me Okay. because it's a promising story, especially considering that it's uh, Zoe Kravitz's directorial debut. And okay. as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a very smart and confident one where she just, she has her director's eye focused. Okay. I just wish the story was a little more focused like that. Because there's moments where this movie is very sharp, and then there's moments where the dialogue just kind of falls on your ears, and it's, like, very clunky. Okay. Well, you kind of expect that. I mean, you don't expect a person's first movie to be perfect, I would imagine, right? Well, no. I mean, everybody it, everybody has their, you know, your mileage is going to vary with that sort of thing. Okay. For sure. But All right. It, it's it's still it's a good movie. Like I, it was funny because we got to the end of it, and then my wife looks over at me. She's like, and I said, "What do you think of it?" And she's like, "I want to know what you think of it first <laughs> because she loves it. Like she she really likes it. But the thing was, she's like, I think this movie is like a litmus test where depending on what someone how someone feels in the audience, this could be like a red flag. Okay, all right, because it is it is very timely subject matter. Okay. And very much like it's very much about power imbalance and inequality between the sexes. And it's it's just it is really good. And when Channing Tatum gets going, he there are scenes in this movie where he is he's putting on some top flight performance. Uh, real quick, imagine if this movie like they set it up to look like it's going to be murder and in death and stuff on the island, but he gets there. And it's just the boringest time, like him showing like old home movies or, you know, stuff he's made. <laughs> like, just imagine if it gets, uh, oh, geez, that would be interesting because you could set up like 90% of this movie to be the most banal experience. And then maybe one little thing sneaks in at the end and it just changes everything. Yeah. And the way that this, the way that this thing is, the way this movie's set up, it kind of does that. And it is very, it, it gets intense. Like, this is the first movie that my wife and I can think of where it actually had a trigger warning in the front. Oh, wow. What yeah, if it was, what if you turn this movie on its head? And I don't know what happens in it, but what if it's like the setup to look like he's going to be the bad guy in this and the girls he invites out actually turn out to be the bad guy and he's like trying to escape from them on his own island? It'd be interesting. That would actually be a very interesting twist. I'm not that's not what happened, but it would be a very interesting twist. It'd be it'd be a different take on that style movie because we've we've had the movie like this where some guy you know brings people over and murders them. Well, yeah, because that, well, it's not exactly multiple murders. Uh, the movie that well, yeah, it is multiple murders, murders, but the movie I automatically thought of when I saw this was a uh, Glass Onion because it's like oh, another millionaire is bringing people to an island and there's untoward conduct. But it's not like it, it's just a setting, and it's okay. just, uh, the reality of this movie is very close, very close to some unpleasant realities we've seen exposed in uh, the news. Delicately dancing over all this because the he one of the headlines I saw in a review basically spoiled who uh, one of the biggest analogs for Channing Tatum's character, and it's like, oh, I kind of wish I didn't know that going in. Oh, okay, all right, Mike Reyes from Cinema Blend on the line with me right now, calling from the library. Uh, what library are you at? I'm going to give a shout out to my former local library. It is the print it, the Plainsboro Public Library over in beautiful Plainsboro, New Jersey. I've seen uh, some more stuff come out about the crow because the embargo's up, and this thing looks like it's just getting its brains bashed in. Oh, it is, and that just makes you want to see it even more. I, I need to see how bad this is. Like I run towards the fire. <laughs> 
This is one of those. What? Yeah, I mean that may. What if it has a huge weekend because of that? Everybody is just like, I want to see how awful this is. Well, I will tell you this much. When I was looking at, t- I didn't look at crow tickets last night, but when I was looking for blink twice tickets. There was actually a local theater of mine that was sold out all three shows of the night. Wow, really? Yeah, so I'm very curious to see. And it wasn't like it wasn't one of the. It was like a mid-sized theater, not like a smaller one. But I was. I'm, I'm going to be surprised to see the numbers after this weekend. Although in terms of the crow, uh, the ori- the director of the original adaptation, Alex Proyas, uh, has a short but sweet reaction on his Facebook. Wow, the reviews are brutal. <laughs> I'm surprised. That he, well, I'm not. Now that I think about it, I'm not surprised he went that soft on it because he's been very critical about this happening and very critical in the past about people didn't want this people did not want it just to happen but it did anyway and that's just kind of like i'm sure that's a little bit of vindication where it's like yeah yeah have done this my grace from cinema blend on the line with me all right we'll let you get back to the library and uh reading your books and stuff and whatever you're doing but uh mike thank you so much for taking a few minutes dude my pleasure as always Shh.